Today we're very happy to have Kate Legner from the Interior Alaska Forest Inventory and Analysis Program with the Forest Service. But before we get started, just a few items to note. Um, I'll ask that everyone puts their phones on mute as we are on one sort of shared line here, so please keep your phones on mute. This webinar is being so that you will be able to see this um, on the Northern Latitudes YouTube channel. We'll get that webinar up in just a little bit. Um, a quick piece about the Northern Latitudes webinar series. We are the five Alaska Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, LCCs. We're public-private partnerships working on the big issues that are too big for uh, any one group or any one entity to approach. And we also work closely with the Alaska Climate Science Center. Our next webinar is going to be that's after the holidays, and it's Shore Zone 101, how to use the Shore Zone coastal imagery. And that will be, um, again, taking place after the holidays, Tuesday, January 9th. Today, we're very happy to have Kate Legner with the First Inventory and Analysis, or FIA, program with the Forest Service. She handles logistics, funds, crews, protocols, uh, all sorts of things to make sure that the FIA data is collected for all of interior Alaska. She's worked across Alaska and across the lower 48 in a variety of botany, environmental education, remote fencing, forest ecology, and much, much more. And with that, I am going to switch the PowerPoint and make sure that we're up here and hand it over to Nara. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, there's only four of us in the Anchorage office here, so this feels like a more comfortable presentation than I thought it would. <laughs> um, I know many of the folks that are involved with this LCC and others are current or future partners or collaborators for us at some point in this project. We're going to be doing this into the foreseeable future, so I'm really happy to kind of present um, briefly what FIA is in general, the data that we collect, and then get into a few of the specific details about the relative new Interior Alaska FIA project. So I'll just kind of start with an overview of FIA in general. FIA stands for Forest Inventory and Analysis. I'm going to say FIA a lot because it's a lot easier to say. Uh, we are the nationwide inventory of all forest lands across all land ownerships in the United States. So we're pretty much the nation's forest census. Uh, again, we inventory all land ownerships, so we're not just working on Forest Service lands. We work on private lands, lands run by other agencies, all across the U.S. Uh, you can see on the map here in the lower right-hand corner, we have kind of divided FIA into four regions. We work out of the southern region, the northern region, the Rocky Mountain Interior West region, and then the Alaska program is run out of the Pacific Northwest FIA region. So we also work uh, with Washington, Oregon, California, and all of the Pacific Islands you can see listed there, including the state of Hawaii. Alaska is broken up into two different inventories. We have been doing the coastal inventory for a little while, and recently we've started the Interior Alaska Inventory, which is the project that I coordinate and what I'm going to be talking the most about today. Uh, so briefly, our timeline kind of is on the left there. In 1928, the U.S. Forest Service was tasked by Congress to inventory the nation's forest resources. Um, it was set up in all these regions in different ways for quite a while. Um, in 1998, with the Farm Bill that year, uh, they tasked the Forest Service to have annual inventories with five-year reporting to kind of get things more standard in the FIA program. Uh, during that time, we also started to develop a uniform sample grid and plot design, which I'll talk about on the next slide. By 2010, FIA was established on all lands with potential forests in all 50 states in the country, except for, of course, Interior Alaska. And um, this was a really big oversight and a gap, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, Interior Alaska represents about 15% of all forested land in the United States, so we were missing out on a lot of that data. Until 2014, uh, the Farm Bill that year directed FIA to include Interior Alaska, finally. So in 2014, the Forest Service did just that. Uh, we started the Tanana Valley Pilot Project on the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge and Tanana Valley State Forest up in the Tanana Valley of Interior Alaska. So we, I think we did about 90-some plots that year up there, kind of refining our protocols, making sure everything um, was running smoothly how we wanted it. 
in 2015, we kind of worked through some of the kinks, and then we officially launched the Interior Alaska FIA inventory in 2016, back up in the Tanana Valley. I'll show some maps in a second to clarify any of this. Um, this past summer in 2017, and then this upcoming summer, we will, we will again be working in the Tanana Valley, and we're going to finish it up this year, we hope, fingers crossed. Uh, the year after that, we're going to move into the next unit. I'll show that on the map as well. Um, we're thinking it'll probably be about 10 to 12 years to complete the entire Interior Alaska FIA. Big place. So this is a really dense slide, and there's a lot of information on here that I'll talk through. Um, but I just wanted everybody to kind of be on the same page with how FIA, uh, how the sample plots are organized and located across the country as well as in Alaska. So FIA is unique in that we have a matrix of hexagonal cells that overlay all of the United States. You can see this in the figure up here. This is for just one county in Minnesota, kind of zoomed in. You can see all these hexagonal cells. Within each of those cells, a plot is randomly distributed. So this allows us to have a regular spatial distribution of plots across the entire landscape. Um, in the lower 48, as well as coastal Alaska and the Pacific Islands, for the most part, uh, we have one plot about every 6,000 acres. Up in interior Alaska, we aren't able to do that, mainly for logistical <laughs> funding reasons. Um, so we've decreased our intensity up in interior Alaska, and we have one plot every 30,000 acres. So we are at one-fifth of the intensity of the normal FIA grid. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about sampling cycles because Interior Alaska is different in this way as well compared to the rest of FIA, most of the rest of FIA. Um, most FIA plots are sampled on an annual cycle, as I said in the tam timeline um, previously. Uh, that was kind of just to get everything more standard. So what happens is within a unit, or most often just a state, all the plots within that unit are assigned to a panel, usually one through 10, because they're sampled on a 10-year annual cycle. And so the crews will go out to panel one on year one, they'll work their way through to panel 10 in 10 years, and then start over on panel one um, to remeasure after the 10-year cycle is complete. Um, so uh, there's a few different phases of FI plots that are measured on different cycles. I don't, I'm not gonna get too into the weeds on this, but phase one and phase two, phase one is where somebody sits in the office and says, hey, that plot's forested, we're gonna go to that plot. Phase two is where our crews are out on the ground actually sampling that plot, so we do that on a 10-year cycle. Phase three is a little bit more intensive vegetation sampling, and those are on a five-year cycle, but measured at a lesser intensity of, again, so we only have one plot every 96,000 acres. Um, we don't do these up here in interior Alaska, we're not funded to do them. Coastal Alaska has done them in the past, but it's been a while as well. And nobody's doing them anymore. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Um, so interior Alaska is quite different than that. We are operating on a periodic cycle, which means that we've split all of interior Alaska into subunits, and then we sample all the plots within that subunit in a year or a few years. And I'll show that on the map here. So this is simply because we can't get around the entirety of interior Alaska in a year. We can't go all the way to the North Slope and all the way down to the Southwest and back and forth and back and forth <laughs> and get it done. So this has been simplified in that way. The Pacific Islands also operate on a 10-year uh, periodic cycle as well for this similar reason. So the interior uh, is split into six subunits, as I mentioned, and those are kind of outlined on this map with the purple borders. We've started in the Tanana Valley. You can see that there has the different colored plots. I know this is probably hard to see uh, at this scale, but the blue plots are the plots that we've completed so far. The red plots are the plots that we have left to do this upcoming year. After we complete the Tanana Valley, we're going to move into the Susitna Copper, which is the subunit to the south there. And we are, aren't quite sure of our movement after that, but we're looking probably at going to the southwest unit after that then to the lower Yukon, and then we're probably going to combine the North Slope and the Upper Yukon. You can see there is not much forested land up on the North Slope there. So again, the plots pictured here, or represented on this map, are just forested plots. And we have about 4,858 of those in interior Alaska. That's excluding all those other plots that are on that grid that I mentioned that aren't forested. We won't be going to those. So this is 
a super dense slide, but I kind of wanted to talk about FIA goals in general and then break it down into some of the more specific goals for Interior Alaska. Um, FIA in general, we want to estimate forest area by forest type and stand size class. We also want to estimate the number, volume, biomass, and garbage storage for tree species by diameter class. We estimate the number of trees affected by damages, so those are things like insects and diseases. And we monitor the change over time in forests and the spread of invasive plants. And this change over time, uh, we can see that through our remeasurement of these plots. And then last but of course not least, we want to research locally and regionally relevant forest issues. And some of those fall into our interior goals for Interior Alaska. Um, so a big goal for us in the interior, since we are just starting this inventory up, is to develop cooperative efforts among groups involved in resource inventory in the interior, and that's you guys. Um, we know our data is valuable to many people, and people want to know what we're doing, how they can use the data, and that's a big objective for us to find those people and make sure we're talking to them. We also want to obtain baseline inventory data and use this to understand future boreal forest change. So again, we haven't visited any of these plots in the interior. Like most of the rest of FIA plots are in their remeasurement phase. We're just getting our baseline inventory at this time, and we're going to use that data in the future once we start to remeasure these plots to get at uh, forest change. We want to incorporate boreal forest carbon storage components into our estimates. So other units uh, don't quite look at things in depth, like we're looking at ground cover, which are lichens and mosses, and uh, soil carbon which are two really important components in interior forests that we are um, inventorying as well. We want to understand complex boreal forest dynamics, things that are specific to the boreal forest, uh, like fire, permafrost, uh, carbon storage, and some of those different components like ground layer and soils, and then species distribution and changes in species distribution up there. And then we finally want to integrate remote sensing into our on-the-ground inventory. So since we only have one plot every 30,000 acres, and, um, we don't have that dense plot grid like a lot of the other FIA units. We're using remote sensing to kind of scale up our on-the-ground measurements to the landscape level. And I'll talk about that shortly, too. OK, so now I want to just real briefly kind of brush over the actual data that we collect on the ground. Um, our manual is huge, so this is a really broad brush approach to this. Anybody has any questions, we can answer those. So uh, our FIA plots, this large plot that I drew the orange circle around, is what is represented by each of those dots on the map. And the plot represents approximately a 1.5 acre area. Within that overall plot, we get kind of the broad level forest data, like forest type, stand size, stand disturbance, stand age. We collect tree cores on the plot. And then we look at physical characteristics of the plot, like slope and aspect and things like that. Within each plot, then, there are four subplots, which are 24 foot in radius. And on each of these subplots is where we kind of collect the bulk of our data. Uh, we collect all kinds of information on trees, obviously. So from subplot center, we measure the azimuth and distance to each tree on that subplot, so we kind of map them out. We measure diameter and height, and that's to get at biomass and carbon. We look at cull and rot on each tree. We record what the tree species is, whether it's alive or dead. Uh, we look at damages on each individual tree, again, insects and diseases in the area. And then we assess the crown, uh, where it stands in the canopy and how compacted it is. On the subplot, we also look at all the vegetation. We record species composition of the dominant species. And then we uh, evaluate vegetation structure by different vegetation layers. Um, then we look at woody debris, what kinds of species of woody debris there are, what size, diameter they are, and the position of them on the subplot along a transect. And then specific to the interior again, and I'll talk about these on the next two slides, are ground cover and soils. So for ground cover, we look at mosses and lichens. We record those by functional group, which I'll show in a second. And we look at the cover class of each functional group and the thickness of each uh, functional group. And then soils, we collect a soil sample on subplots 2, 3, and 4. So those are the subplots around the periphery of the plot here, not that center one. We probe with the soil probe down to the frozen layer and record the depth of that. 
And then we also pull out a soil core. We divide it into organic and mineral layers. Uh, we measure those uh, for thickness so we can get the volume of each layer. Then we bag up those layers, take them back to the lab so we can get at the total percent carbon and nitrogen in each soil layer. And then last is the microplot, which is the little red dot within each subplot. The microplot is a little bit different in interior Alaska as well. We measure saplings, so those are trees that are under five inches in diameter and over one inch in diameter. And we measure those on a 9.6 foot radius plot. We do a larger subplot than other FIA units because we want to make sure we're measuring all those small trees out in the interior, all those black spruce. And then we count all the seedlings on a 6.8 foot radius plot. And so then I mentioned I was going to talk about soils and ground cover since these are two really important components of the Interior Alaska Protocol that we're collecting. Um, this figure up here isn't the final figure by any means, but this is some of the data that was collected during the 2014 pilot project that we did. Um, so overall on the plots, if you look at just these four carbon pools, live trees, dead trees, down woody material, and soils, you can see that soils represent the majority of carbon in those plots. So it's obviously a really important thing that we need to be looking at um, in interior Alaska. So a uh, picture up there is one of our cores, one of the longer ones actually. I use that to impress everybody about how much organic <laughs> material is on the plot. Um, and I've kind of drawn these yellow lines to show the different layers that we collect. So starting on the right-hand side, above that first yellow line would be any litter. We collect that, measure the thickness of it, and collect it separately. Below that, you can kind of see there's a little bit of green moss. Uh, that would be live moss and lichen collected separately. Below that is identifiable organic material. So that uh, is any dead moss as well as any other materials that you can say, hey, I know what that is. Uh, tell what it is, not too decomposed yet. Uh, below that, we have unidentifiable organic, so the stuff that is too decomposed to tell what it is. And then finally, at the bottom is the mineral soil layer. And we only collect a maximum of four inches of this. So our core only goes down to four inches of mineral soil or a maximum of 40 inches. We don't go any deeper than that. So in the field, we measure the thickness of each of these layers, as I said, and that can allow us to get at the volume of each of the layers. We do a quick texture of the mineral soil, and then again, we probe with a real narrow soil probe down to the frozen layer, and we get that at the time of visit. We bag and return the layers to the lab, and then they give us the dry weight, which we can use to calculate bulk density, and they also give us the total percent nitrogen and total percent carbon. We're working on getting pH from the lab shortly as well. So the next big piece in Interior Alaska is the ground cover protocol. Uh, ground cover in interior is obviously important for really obvious reasons, like critical winter forage for animals like caribou, but it also serves a lot of other uh, more subtle purposes, I guess. Uh, enhances nutrient cycling, it helps with water regulation, and it's obviously a big uh, source of carbon storage up there, too. So in figuring out how we wanted to collect ground cover data, uh, a lot of research went into how we were going to do it, uh, make it collectible for the crews, but also usable for our scientists and analysts. Since this could get really into the weeds, we wanted to make it something that was fairly quick for our crews to collect. So what they did was divide it up into 12 different functional groups of mosses and lichens based on growth form or habit and ecosystem function. So an example of this is we split feather moss from nitrogen fixing feather moss. We also split out forage lichens, for example. Our crews in the field go out with the little microquad rectangle that you can see in the upper right. And we put, again, eight of those per each subplot along a transect. And then they will record the cover class of each functional group they see in there, and then use that little chaining pin to record an average depth class of each functional group. Sometimes within that little microquad, how big is that? It's like 40 by 20. It's pretty small. <laughs> But you can you know, get up to like six or seven different functional groups in a really small microquad on these plots. Uh, this data then comes back to the office and using some of the calibration models that were developed when we kind of developed this protocol, they can be scaled up to the plot and landscape level for biomass and carbon and nitrogen content. 
so I mentioned remote sensing is a really important part of the Interior Alaska FIA because we do have a, a less dense plot grid up there, one plot every 30,000 acres. So we are using this G-Light with uh, cooperating with NASA to collect G-Light over our plots. And G-Light is an airborne imaging system that simultaneously maps the composition, structure, and condition of vegetation using three different main components. So the three components in G-Light, the LI stands for LIDAR, which is that point cloud I'm sure most people are familiar with that can allow you to uh, see a three, the 3D structure of vegetation. We also, the H stands for hyperspectral, so the G-Light sensor collects hyperspectral data that can allow us to get at species composition and variables in biophysical, or variations in biophysical variables, things like leaf area index, things like that. And then the third is a thermal sensor, which allows us to see the surface temperature, changes in heat or moisture stress. So the sensor is attached to this plane that flies in flight lines all over our plots before we go out there. Uh, you can see the figure on the bottom here, the map. The red lines are where the airplane flew with this G-Light sensor over the Tanana Valley over our plot in 2014. At this time, high-resolution aerial imagery was also collected with a fine-resolution DSLR camera. You can see some of the pictures of that in the upper right. However, we weren't able to quite use that for our planning purposes for the Tanana Valley, and we're hoping to get some better imagery for the Susitna Copper. As you can see, it's really useful data to have um, to see what's out there. So all the six units are going to be flown in this way. And then um, all of this data will be used to help us scale up our measurements again from our on-the-ground plots uh, to the landscape level. Um, so kind of my final piece of my presentation here, I wanted to get into a little bit more of the logistics and partnerships piece of thing piece of everything because this is a big part of my job. Uh, before I get into that, I want to thank our cooperators and just mention the role that they have in this inventory. So our big cooperator is the State of Alaska Division of Forestry. My counterpart there is Matt Stevens. He's the State of Alaska FIA Interior Alaska Coordinator, and I am the Forest Service side of that. And we work really closely together to make sure this project is moving forward. The State of Alaska does the majority of our logistics planning. They do all of our crew hiring and supervising, and they do most of our gear, obtain most of our gear and manage our gear, which is no small task for those guys. We also cooperate closely with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We send our soil samples to the Forest Soils Lab there, and they have been very helpful at getting things organized for us during the first few years of our inventory, helping us figure out what exactly we want to measure and how. We also work with the University of Alaska Anchorage, the Sullivan Lab here in Anchorage analyzes our tree cores for us, and they're also using our uh, data to help them develop some publications and research. We cooperate with the Tanana Chiefs Conference. We share our manual and our protocol. We, they come to our training and learn how we're doing FIA a little bit differently every year so that they can go out and do FIA-like plots on lands that they actually manage. Again, uh, as I said, we work with NASA to get our G-Light and aerial imagery acquired every unit. And then we work with all the other agencies, the big ones, BLM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. And we don't only want to work with these guys to help us access our plots, although that's an important piece, but we also want to make sure that we have data sharing agreements in place with these folks so that we're all working cooperatively together as we go across this huge state and collect all this data. Uh, so I was just going to show a little bit more of our planning. So um, when I say how big and painful things can be, you all understand. <laughs> um, um, this map is kind of zoomed in on the unit that we've been working on the past few years and the unit that we're going to move into. So the top is the Tanana Valley unit. All the plots on here are just color-coded according to when they were either completed or when they will be done. In the Tanana Valley unit, you can see those teal blue plots. On the west side of the unit, we're completed in 2016. We worked out of Manly Hot Springs and Nanana during that summer. This past summer, we completed some more plots. We did 229. We were located out of Fairbanks and Delta Junction during that time. This upcoming season, we're going to really ramp it up and get 289 plots, and hopefully 64 of those out of Denali National Park, as you can see on that map here. 
And for this next summer, we're going to be working out of chicken, mainly out of toke, and then potentially out of Kantishna in Denali National Park, all subject to change. <laughs> Uh, after this upcoming field season, again, we're going to move into the Susitna Copper Unit in 2019, and that should take us about a year and a half uh, to complete that unit. And all those plots are in black there. Uh, so in terms of actually getting our people on the ground, uh, once we are in one of those hubs that I mentioned, so this past summer, working out of Fairbanks or Delta Junction, we will try to get to most of the plots within a 65 foot or 65 mile, excuse me, radius or so from each of those hubs. And to do that, we use a helicopter. We have a few plots that are accessible by road or boat, but not many in the interior. And especially as we move into these other units where there's less uh, on the road system, it'll be fewer and farther between. So we send out a crew in the morning in the helicopter. Again, most of these plots we haven't seen before. The imagery we have isn't that great. So we go in not quite knowing where we're going to land them what the hike's going to look like, even how long the plot will take them to accomplish. So they'll fly in in the morning, uh, find a safe landing zone, helicopter will land and drop them off, and then they'll hike into the plot. And in the interior, that can sometimes be dicey. As you can see in the photos here, we have fires. We've got a lot of match st matchstick, waist-high trees to hike through sometimes, or enormous tussocks like the picture in the right. So our crews are definitely <laughs> working hard out there, and we appreciate all the work that they do. Um, it's by no means easy. We're looking forward to getting some better imagery, as I said, in the future so that we can know what the plots look like. However, it's not going to help us as much for uh, what our landing zones will look like since that imagery will not be covered, or the, the photos that we're taking um, with the plane, the G-Light sensor, won't be covering the areas all around the plots. And sometimes, like I said, we have to hike a mile or two in. Um, so then I just quickly wanted to kind of share some of our successes and challenges that we had this past field season because these are going to be things uh, that continue to come up as we go forward. We have a lot to learn, obviously, but we're really so proud of what we've accomplished. Um, this past field season, we trained 11 new field crew. We only had one returning employee. So we can't hire permanent folks. Um, so it's always a success when we can train all these new folks in the FIA protocol. It's very intensive. We hold a month-long training in Fairbanks, usually during the month of May. We're going to be doing that again this year and have we're going to be doubling the size of our crew. So it'll be another success if we get this done again. Uh, we, our interagency team worked really well together, the state and the federal. Uh, sometimes people feel like there can be tension or something, but we had a really great time out there and we're working hard to make sure we're working well together. We had a really safe year out in the field. We had two real close bear encounters, but the crews handled those really well. We had a low fire year, so it was easy for us to get out into the field every day. We didn't have to deal with a lot of smoke or being stuck on the ground. That's always great in the interior when that works out. Uh, we had one crew get stuck in the field just once due to a helicopter maintenance issues, but we send our crews out there fully prepared to be ready for that inevitability, and those guys handled it like champs. Uh, we met our plot goal this year. We did 229 plots, and then we send a group of quality assurance folks out to 5% of the plots that we do to make sure our crews are collecting quality data. And the plots that they visited scored an average of 90.8%. So that's an A, A plus. Uh, we also <laughs> obtained some additional funding at the end of this season to help with some recon and outreach, and I'll talk about both of those pieces. Um, we used that funding to complete recon of 88 plots out of Toke, which is where we're going to be based next summer. And again, this is really an important piece for us to do. We, send, we sent a crew of two out in the helicopter to fly over the plots, look at how hard those plots were going to be, um, how time consuming, what the hike would look like, and where the helicopter could land. This saves us a ton of time during the field season, um, but hopefully next year that will be good for us. A few of our challenges then that definitely will continue as time goes on. We have some interagency challenges that we're working through. We have hiring limitations with the state. Uh, we haven't been able to hire permanent employees at this point, so that limits our crew development a little bit. Uh, we have interagency policy differences. Obviously, any agencies would, federal and state working together definitely do. We're working through those to build project policies a little bit more clearly. 
And then we contract through the state for everything from our helicopter contract to our remote camps, and that's a little bit different than we've done before with FIA program up here in Alaska. Also, the lack of imagery, as I mentioned, is consistently a challenge for us getting out in the field, not knowing what's out there. We have all new plots every single year. A lot of the other FIA units are in their remeasurement phase. We are not, so we're going out there frequently sight unseen, spending a lot of extra time to install the new plot in a brand new area. So with those constraints, we're always trying to figure out how to accomplish more plots to get the interior unit done in time. We work uh, to try to figure out how can we change our crew size or our schedule. Do we need to have more than one base of operations or more than one helicopter to get things done on time and get that data ready to go? As we move into the next unit, it'll again be an all-new landscape. In the future, after this, we sit in the copper unit. We're going to be further from the road system, as I mentioned. And after that, we we'll, might be working out of some of these uh, native villages. And we just need to be sensitive to that and aware of the differences uh, in working out of those towns. So in order to address some of the challenges that we will encounter working in all new areas where FIA has not been, and also in these smaller communities, we're working to uh, build up a little bit more outreach and community engagement. So our goal with this is to c include the community in our project by informing them of what we're doing out there. We want to develop relationships with the people on the ground that we're actually going to be working around or with and actually work with them. We want to increase understanding on both sides. So when we come in and are working out of one of these hubs, we want to make sure that people uh, know what we're doing, but we also want to be sensitive and understand what's going on in that town. Um, how can we operate more smoothly out of there? What kind of data do they want from us, et cetera? And all this together will definitely help us meet our goals to collect all this data around the interior. So uh, this was kind of dense as well, but in 2017, we created a few new outreach documents. You can see those up on the right. We have a poster. We hung that up around Delta Junction this summer. And then we have a brochure and a project business card, and we distributed all these things to several local businesses. We had our crews distribute these to some landowners that they encountered, and it kind of gave them a way to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's somebody to call uh, in a really succinct way that's easy for folks to reference in the future. This project business card is also really important to us because, again, it's a state and federal project combined. It's not one of us. It's both of us. Both of our logos are on there. Both of our names are on there. People in any of these areas can contact whichever one of us they feel more comfortable talking to about the project. Um, we also had the opportunity to do a radio interview up in Fairbanks after the field season, which was really great. And we're looking forward to doing some more of those potentially in Toke or other towns down the road to get out the word when we're working out of these hubs, what we're doing and why. In 2018, for the 2018 field season, Matt Stevens with the state and I had the opportunity to do a little outreach trip to Chicken and Toke. And we again brought these materials to pretty much everybody in the town of Chicken and several of the other agencies and businesses and people around Toke. We're also working on scheduling some a school and community presentation in Toke, and then some type of community presentation in Potluck and Chicken, again, to make sure everybody's comfortable with us. Now we have a few other ideas of things that we can do to help uh, community engagement and outreach going forward for the interior. So what's next? I've probably said this 100 times, but we're going to finish the Tanana unit this upcoming summer, and that data should potentially be available in the fall of 2019, we're hoping, crossing our fingers. After that, we're moving into the Susitna Copper Unit, where we have 438 forested plots. And then beyond, you can see the units listed here with the number of plots out of the total num or number of forested plots, excuse me, out of the total number of plots that were on the FIA grid. So in the Southwest Unit, for example, we have 919 potentially forested or forested plots out of a total of 2,529 plots that were on the plot grid. On the north slope, we only have five, so it'll be quick. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's it. Uh, I definitely want to open the floor for questions if anybody's got anything or clarify anything anybody would like to know more about. Yeah, we'll just give Kate um, a breather here real quick and say thanks for a great presentation. Um, why don't we start in Fairbanks with questions, if anyone in Fairbanks 
Um, please go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. Just the, um, the G light imagery is uh, interesting to me, and just wondering if that's publicly accessible. Uh, so I'm just going to also hand, I didn't mention, but my boss, uh, Brent Mueller, is here. He's the team leader for data collection for interior Alaska, coastal Alaska, and the Pacific Islands. And then we also have Beth Schultz, who is our vegetation ecologist. So I'm going to let those guys chime in for some of these questions because they might know the answers better than I as well. Uh, yeah, with regards to, I guess, the, the G-Later remotely sensed data, that's definitely the long-term goal or plan is to make that publicly available. I think right now they're just trying to work through like the, the volume of data. I mean, I think when they did those flight lines, it was 28 to 30 terabytes of data. So taking that data and uh, digesting that or boiling that down into potentially uh, useful products for different user groups is definitely going to take a little bit and something that they're working through. Uh, but Hans Anderson is our kind of lead scientist in, in that realm. Um, so if you're interested, you could follow up with Kate or myself, and we could potentially put you in contact with Hans to see where they're at in that process. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I have a little bit of interest. Just I work on the fire management side, and so I'm always looking at uh, imagery anyway, and so it's just nice to have another tool, another um, resource to go to for, for a different view sometimes. Yeah, definitely. That's how we feel, too. So. <laughs> Understood. Imagery has definitely been, been limiting. Mm -hmm. Any questions online? Any folks who've tuned in remotely? I will start another question here. Um, can you talk a bit more about that integration of the remotely sensed data with the plot data and perhaps how those two come together? Oh, you want to give it a try? I'm <laughs> <laughs> not the subject matter expert on this one. Yeah, we are not the subject matter experts on this one for sure. That is, again, Hans Anderson. He's yeah. the one who's collected all this data with NASA, and we're working directly with NASA to kind of do some of this. Um, the data is collected directly over all of our plots, and then it's a 350-meter swath kind of along the plots. So it's not wall-to-wall -wall, um, data by any means. But as far as, like, the process that they go through to scale that up, yeah, I'm not sure. But mostly they're taking the ground data to, to verify yeah. what, they're, what they're measuring cool. from the remotely sensed data so that we can expand that beyond just the plot footprint. Yeah, and then also use our remotely sensed data with, like, satellite data to expand it wall-to-wall -wall as well. And I know as far as some of those processes and formula type stuff, I know that they've been working on that as part of all the way back from the pilot data in 2014. And I'm pretty sure the last thing I heard is that I think they're getting ready to try to share some of their preliminary kind of formulas or results of compiling that data, probably hopefully around February. Yeah. And they're getting ready to fly the copper to sit in this summer. Um, NASA is with uh, this imagery as well. So we'll start working on that. And talking about um, maybe concentrating over some of the large shrub areas that we have more missing in our inventory. Very well. And it's starting to be recognized that we need to do a little bit better job at that. And nobody wants to go in there and measure large alder stems. mention the, the GTR publication that's coming out sometime soon that might have a little bit of a summary. I don't know, I mean, Beth, you could speak to that. You hope you're one of the authors. Yeah, we have, uh, there's a GTR coming out on the pilot, just the 2014 data. Which stands for what? Um, a, general. a general technical report, um, and that should be coming out, I would think, in the next few months in working through it, the, the CAP process. And then there's other, there are other folks working on the, the data as well, like I have another, uh, kind of add another bullet for the UAA, um, ACCS, uh, Alaska Conservation. Center for Conservation Science. 
There you go. <laughs> um, as, Acronym for uh, words. <laughs> looking at the vegetation data and um, trying to use that to help us refine the national veg classification. And the selection of the microplots within the larger grid. Um, again, this is how does how do you select those, those sites? So there's the overall plot, and then there's the subplots within that, and then there's the microplot within yep. the subplot. So it's just there's a standard standard dimensions to the plot, which angle is subplot one from the center of that plot. So subplot one is 360 degrees. And then within subplot one, all the microplots are directly east of the micro or subplot center. Yeah, are you talking about the ones for the, the lichen and moss surveys? Oh, uh, or I was thinking the of sampling. The, I was thinking of the large grid, the subplots and the microplots. And is that mm -hmm. is that uniform across its mm -hmm. standard? Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's kind of the power of the big national sampling design is to keep the subplot layout and the microplot design the same. The only thing that we changed with the interiors, we expanded the size of the microplot a little bit to try to capture some of those smaller diameter trees. 